Welcome to the Block Party Academy, where we teach you from the ground up how to play offensive line. Today, we're getting into some ground-breaking standardized offensive line testing. Let's go. Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Coach Parker with another episode of Block Party Academy. I am the run game coordinator and offensive line coach at Fair State University, located in Big Rapids, Michigan, founded in 1884 by Woodbridge Ferris, who would go on to be the governor. They called him the school teacher from up north. Well, I got something else for you. I'm the virtual teacher from up north. We're gonna teach you something fun, different, exciting today. We are talking about a standardized offensive line testing program. This is going to be something that uh, my guys, so my guys that are watching right now, buckle up. This is the testing that we're about to do um, and we'll go forward doing. And for anybody outside, this is a, you know, something I'm really excited about. You can tell I'm bringing a different level of energy to this one here. Um, part of, and there's a bunch of reasons to it, but, uh, and I'll go into them as we go along here, but the, the, the crux is this, okay. And what COVID has taught me, um, or taught me, you know, when we're going through it is, is what do you have accessible to you guys when you're not around? And what do you have accessible training module wise that they can do at any point? that directly relates to your skill development and training. Um, I would love to say, you know, sending them a, a thing of pass protection drills, but there's nothing really for a run game. You need a buddy. So let's say you are alone. Let's say you're on vacation. Let's say, you know, you're, um, you, you've, you've got COVID and you can't you know, get out of the house for two weeks, whatever it may be. And maybe your resources are limited. Uh, I want to have something that anybody can do that's that is super efficient and super with exactly what we're teaching them so that is what we're going to cover today this is a very unusual approach to this i, I spoke we had uh glazier come up to big rapids and this was the presentation i gave so for you guys that were there i appreciate it it's finally coming up here i wasn't able to record myself there and i'm kind of glad um because i did miss a couple of the coaching points uh, that now I, you know, that we're into right now. I do want to say this right off the bat that we have not tested as a unit in, with any of this. We have not done this. I can't show you results. I can't show you um, really much anything of where we're progressing right now, which, in my opinion, is pretty incredible as is. Um, and it's enough that I'm jumping from the rooftops about it and I'm super excited, especially to see how it develops moving forward and helping people out, okay? So with all that jargon being said, let's dive into it here. So this is a bare bones approach to take your offensive line to another level. And you could use this with other position groups, you, you know, and to be honest with you, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a training exercise that I will do. And there's me plugging the Block Party Academy, which if you haven't, freaking tag in. Like and subscribe, dude. <laughs> uh, so the big thing here, all right, um, that I want to lead off by saying is this came about from me wanting to be selfish as a coach. You know, this series came about me being selfish as a coach. Uh, there is a great movie from 1999 called Election, directed by Alexander Payne, starring Matthew Broderick, Reese Witherspoon. Um, and it is about... Just it, just a high high school election, and it's funny, and it's it, it, I highly highly recommend. And in it, uh, they they show the teacher, and she's talking about how she feels sorry for him because year after year he's doing the same lesson plan, and he goes up to the board and he draws an apple and he draws an orange, and then he goes through and he draws an apple and an orange. 
And it's year after year after year of the same thing. Well, as we were progressing with this, I was, I'm just so over the install, you know, we're wasting a full week to go over explaining how to ID a front. We're, we're wasting a week of going over our base runs that we should all know. And guys, you know, and, and if you're a fifth year guy and you're in that meeting and it's the fifth year go around that you're installing inside zone. And as a coach, you might want to tailor it for them and you might want to rush it and get through it as fast as possible. But then you have all these newcomers in the room that they have all these questions and, you know, everything. So that's why I wanted to make the series. And then I figured as might as well as I'm doing it, just make it accessible to anybody because I think coaching philosophy should be accessible for anybody um, and allows you guys to pick my brain without me doing it. So with that being said, selfishly, I, I, I'm kind of over uh, giving each kid in my room a, a, a set of workout what to focus on. And I've been doing it over the years and I'm very good at identifying what the weaknesses are, the strengths are, what you can put on, you know, a little bit of autopilot or dial back on and what you need to really emphasize on and how to combine these things. And, um, you know, and then coaches bringing that to me and me having to go through it with them. And, you, you know, there's all these things that you you get to and it's just, okay, is there a better way to do this? And so this is kind of how I landed onto that or landed onto that. So, and what it will do is allow me to spend more time on the important things and the things that matter for my guys. So now I can invest more time in, uh, you know, getting our protections right, getting a drill that's going to be accessible, giving them even more learning materials to deal with, giving them, you know, all of those things, get, getting them to be better leaders and, you know, and moving forward with that. So that's what I'm talking about, being selfish as a coach. And at times you got to really get to that point. So being in that mindset of, okay, selfishly as a coach, what do I, what, what, what can I do to allow more time for myself so I can have other time to think of these other, you know, problems and other ways to do it. And at the D2 level too, I mean, you got to do it because you, they're, they're, the lack of support or what you've got to do is very difficult. We have a ton, um, but we're, we, we got a lot of guys that want to be attached to a championship culture um, and they're allowed to coach. It's actually, I mean, it's phenomenal for a young coach to be at Fair State, uh, you know, minus the pay. But, it, you know, that doesn't exist everywhere. So you do have these secondary duties that you have to deal with. And you, you got to be able to manage all of that. So thinking selfishly, it got me thinking, like, I wish there was a way to create a standard measurement to ensure an offensive lineman was fit enough to execute what I was asking him to execute. I'm obsessed right now. I got the baby. It's midnight. Uh, she's asleep on my chest. I, I'm trying to, you know, wait 20 minutes to feed her her bottle or whatever. And I'm watching a lot of Gordon Ramsay, a lot of kitchen nightmares, a lot of hotel hell on YouTube, full episodes, a slight plug. Uh, but I, I love because it's every episode is the same. And it, but it's just the characters that are involved. But he walks in, your food's bad. You have poor communication. You you know you you can't. There's zero leadership. And if you take all of those things and just put them into football, it's the same deal. So when coaches are coming to me or players coming to me for this magic drill, well, I got it. Here you go. But at the end of the day, the the thing that he always goes back to is let's look at the walk-in fridge. He sees that raw chicken next to the cooked beef and it's over, right? Or he, he's walking in there and there's rotting vegetables or it's dirty. And it, it is such a good analogy to your development and training. If you are not fit, if your kitchen isn't clean, if you're, you, you, you aren't, you know, recycling those fresh ingredients and managing and having maintenance, what's the purpose if I give you the best recipe in the world? You're not going to be able to execute it because you got raw chicken next to cooked beef. And so I, I think that's what it comes back to. And so uh, before I'm asking the guy now, I'm like, man, you know, I'm asking this guy to execute this block. And I think the more that I coach him up onto it, well, I'm giving him the most perfect technique he could ask for. I'm giving him all of the attention. I'm giving him everything. But what is this guy giving back? Is he even fit enough? Is he 
able to execute what I'm asking him to. So much like the combine does this, um, you know, of the of testing, but for the combine, it doesn't specifically pertain to on the field. It's a great measurement of overall, you know, overall strength, health, and all that stuff. And if it was a direct correlation to the field, then the guys that run the fastest 40 would be the best wide receivers. Or the O-lineman or D-lineman that gets the most 225 reps would be the most powerful offensive lineman or D-lineman on the field. There is a close enough correlation. You know, if I get 40 reps at 225, I'm probably going to be a really strong player. Am I going to be the strongest, though? And also, does that make me a better offensive lineman or a worse offensive lineman? So those are the things I wanted to clear up and create something for it. And um, and it also, too, creates clarity on the expectations to play at Fair State. A lot of guys want to play at Fair State. A lot of guys want to play at a higher level of football. Well, what is the baseline? What What is the measurement to know, okay, this guy can come here and play? And don't get me wrong, there's outliers in any testing that you do. Uh, you know, you, you test for... Um, you know, the ACT or the SAT. And there's always an example of, well, you know, Bill Gates got a 900 on the SAT or uh, no shot. No, no offense to Bill. I don't even know if he took it, but there's those outliers, right? Albert Einstein didn't talk to, he was four. It's like, okay, you know, that's a measurement that he is an outlier on, you know? And so getting into the, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but the purpose of this will achieve just that. All right, of getting better. So I'm right into it. Okay, let's create one. And before we create a testing measurement, we got to ID what's important here. What are the things that we're checking to see and make sure that are important? So I don't know if I can, I eh, probably can, but this is, you know, just a highlight tape of uh, Tyrone Smith, who's one of the best tackles in the NFL. And just seeing a freeze frame of him and his stance here. Um, you know, you can see that he's he's got muscle definition. He's got, you know, mass to him. He's got great bend. He's got great, you know, coil in his stance. All of these things that we're looking for, right? So that's just, I'm looking at who did it the best, okay? And so he's one of them, right? I always go to this guy. This is Pavel Bohar. He is a 210-pound sumo wrestler. So although he's not an offensive lineman, he is an amazing, amazing athlete at moving large men with a smaller frame. He's one of the best in terms of pound per pound, you know, of the, the obstacle you're going against. So in, in terms of his technique, he's got to be perfect with that technique in order for it to execute. So, okay, Tyrone Smith, Pavel Bohar. So I can see at the worst with my guys what their technique could look like through training and practice and dedication. And at the best, I can see what they're, you know, what, what it would look like in the, in the tangibles that I want to pick from Tyrone Smith to apply to my guys. And then, you know, I think this is Panay Sewell at his pro day, who at the time I think is like 20, pretty sure he was 20, maybe 21. But that's pretty much the age of the guys who I'm coaching. And he right now is one of the best tackles in the league and was a big time prospect. We're also in Michigan, which I think my guys can relate or enjoy seeing him that we one of the best alignment in the league is playing for the Detroit Lions. And so, uh, you know, watching him and seeing how he moves and, and all of these things and his bend and his flexibility and his mobility and really picking all of those aspects. So when it comes to all of that, I bring it back to, okay, so what's important? And this is what we get out of what's important, all right? And this is, you know, three things. And number one is mass. So in terms of your development training and all of that, mobility, endurance, strength, and skill, okay? And the strength category also duels for that explosion, all right? I just, you know, I've already got the E. All right, can't have two E's, can't be me's, and it's clear with four letters. So we're going to combine it in there, right? Um, and that power that we're talking about. So if you took this and it was a pie chart, right? We would want it to be just like this, right? We would want to be like, okay, perfectly, you know, we're, we're flexible. 
you know, we're spending 25% on our mobility, we're spending 25% on our endurance, we're spending 25% on our strength, and we're spending 25% on our skill. And again, that explosion is a part of our strength. It can also be a part of our endurance and how many times we can explode or in the weight room, right? Sometimes we're going for reps and not necessarily power and strength. Um, but that's those are the four categories that we should always be training. And what it will look like, okay, at the end of the day, so if I mark it here, so M, E, S, and S, right? So if I spent year-round training, these should all be even, but nobody is perfectly even. So if I did myself as a player, I would say this is how much time I spent on strength training. <laughs> say this is probably mobility. If I got to it, great, whatever. I would say, and then the rest would be endurance is this big portion, and then skill was a complete you know, borderline afterthought, but I would always rather do skill training than mobility, right? And so what that looks like now is I have that kind of DNA, all right? That's what I've spent years and years doing. I was a power lifter, love power lifting, love being in the weight room, hitting weights, and love running wind sprints um, or short shuttles or whatever agility in terms of my endurance. Uh, my mobility consisted of me hitting a five pound weight with the my shoulder rotation before I went to like max effort bench press. And my skill was, you know, only in the summer that I'm getting in a three point stance running around or whatever activity we have, right? So when it comes to this, your players are gonna have different DNAs, okay? And so we wanna make sure that this is even. We wanna make, we wanna aim for this in terms of our total percentage and what we look like, you know? And so when you do have it, on the left here, what are we gonna do? So I see all half the time is spent on strength. So that one's gotta be, you know, the smallest one. I gotta increase my mobility, I gotta increase my skill, and I can tune down my endurance and strength. And what I can also do is train endurance and strength at the same time in that weight room and condense that down into you know a faster, more uh, uh, high rep, um, high interval training workout which will allow me for more mobility or, you know, and whatever it is, but those all fluctuate into an even pie chart. So whatever your guy has, or whatever you have, you got to do some soul searching and, and check it out. Because if you're telling me that you're this coach, I'm all the way around, I'm all the way, I'm perfect. Then you're just a straight liar, right? Because you got to go all the way back. Think of when you first started training for football, how much mobility are you doing? All right, we'll talk about the importance of that in a, in a little bit here. The second one here is ass ass, and this is just our fundamentals and foundations. Alignment, split, stance, assignment, step, strike. So I want this training to correlate with this. Alignment and split, you train with every drill that you do. Having the focus on alignment and split um, in terms of the squat rack, where you're loading up from, the bench press, how are you gripping the bar? The guys that don't focus on that have bad alignments and splits. And it also correlates with your weight. The next one that is off the table, you know, a little bit is the assignment, which comes to the coaches. So I want to make sure that we're attacking stance, step, and strike with this. And then the last thing I want to do is keep a scoreboard. I want these guys to be excited and energetic and understand their progress through this. And I want them to, to, to have it. So those are my three um, target zones and the three things I'm aiming to improve on with this. You know, once I identify what's important, well, those are three things that are important. I want to make sure this relates to our mess. Okay, I want to make sure this relates to our ass ass. And I want to make sure that I'm able to keep a scoreboard so that these guys can progress. Okay. So the second step is how do we make this sustainable and achievable? So I think it's it's really important that um, that when we talk about this, that like I can, you know, there's, and don't get me wrong, there's plenty of better drills, but are they sustainable? You know, the combine is incredibly accurate, you know, doing a decathlon, incredibly accurate to your overall athleticism and all of these things, but how sustainable is it? How achievable is it? If we were gonna do a combine, you know, if you want to do one yourself, you need 
somebody to time you. You know, you need all of these people around you. Um, it's a full day of setting up to train for it and all this stuff. So it's just, it's too much. It's too many cones. It's, it's you know, too many people that have to be around, too many sticks, too many measurements, too many of this, that, or the other. So, and then at the end of the day, you, you know, we want to make sure that this, that anybody can do this, you know, from a youth football player all the way up. And so that's kind of the logic I'm into. So with that, okay, number one, I wanted to have limited to zero equipment required. I unfortunately couldn't have zero equipment, but it is very limited. Number two, I want it to be easy to teach. I think it's absurd that we will sit there and as coaches teach guys how to run an L drill for hours and hours and hours where that time could be spent on the game of football and becoming a better football player, not a better L drill runner. Number three, I want this to be safe. I don't want anybody to ever get hurt during testing. I don't want anybody to ever get hurt while they're training to test for something. Number four, I want it to be measurable and not just measurable, but I wanted to have a baseline. Like you need to hit this number to, to, to achieve, you know, a, a point, a percentage, something, you know, and I need to have an overall score. Number five, I want to make sure that the, that the things that we're putting on here are the biggest bang for your buck. So although push-ups are an incredible way to, um, to, to gauge your endurance and strength, are they the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to on the field play for offensive line? Is there a better exercise for strength and endurance than push-ups, right? Um, number six, I don't want to have coaches there. I want guys to be able to do this in their house. I want them to be able to do it, you know, when they're they're hanging out with friends. They're, you know, it's they're they're joking around and doing this stuff. They're they're, you know, it, it, they could be on vacation and hit this workout, and it's full fledged, and it's going to get you better at football. Number seven and eight. I mean, I need this to be different, and I need this to be fun. If it ain't fun, nobody's going to do it. And if it ain't different, if it's the same old, same old then you, you, it gets, it's, it's kind of stale before you even get it out the door, okay? The third step is called skill stacking, all right? So what skill stacking is, is using multiple skills um, at the same time in the amount that you would normally do one. So you heard me say uh, the mess, right? Mobility, endurance, strength, skill. And I said that you can combine endurance with strength. You can also combine endurance with skill and endurance with mobility. Okay, you can combine these things. You can combine strength and mobility. You can combine, you know, mobility and skill and in, in compounding that. So I want to make sure that we have that. Just some examples of, of skill stacking would be, you know, uh, versus me conventional squatting or leg pressing is I'm not really activating anything on my upper body. So let me go overhead squat or maybe a goblet squat where I'm holding it. If, and even when it comes to like pass sets on air, I can skill stack my assignment with that. Like, hey, let's call the protection in the play versus just aimlessly doing a 45 degree kick set. Or, you know, we just went through this whole tape series where you can watch it on your phone versus sitting down and watching it, get off the couch hit a 90-90, get into a, a stretch position, roll out, do something, hit a hip flexor. And that's skill stacking. I'm stretching and I'm watching tape or I'm getting smarter at ball. So the more that we can skill stack, the better that we're going to be. And that was an objective I had here. I want to combine multiple skills um, with each of these and not just have a singular, okay, you do this and it makes your chest bigger. Or you do this and it directly relates to your lats. Like, I want this to be, you know, handle several different skills at the same point. So as we go through, I'll elaborate more on that. The next one that we have is microdosing, okay? Microdosing, not just drug related. I want to make that clear, okay? But you're using simple, easy methods to take that take little to no time to set up, and you can be doing it incrementally throughout the day. This goes back to the get 1% better every day, all right? And I, I think the easiest thing to, to think about when it comes to this is, uh, is if, you, if you have heard or, you know, I'm a big step guy, so losing weight, I count steps, you know, on my watch or my phone. Um, a lot of our staff does it and competes with it. 
And so versus saying I'm going for a, you know, this big 10 mile walk today to get 20,000 steps. Well, I, you know, I might break that up into, you know, you know, five, two mile walks. Right. And then throughout whatever else I'm doing throughout the day, I'm getting 4,000 more steps. And I finish this meal. I'm going to go get a quick walk around the house or I've got 10 minutes to kill. I'm going to pace in the hallway just to get steps. And that's micro dosing throughout the day. Another element to that would be um, if you are a musician and you want to become the world's greatest guitar player, by holding the guitar, just holding it, you're microdosing your guitar skills, okay? I'm getting more comfortable with the neck. I'm, I'm feeling how I would feel, you know, whether I'm playing it or not. And typically, if it's in your hands, you're going to be moving your fingers up and down um, and strumming and messing around and training your hands throughout the day for this. You, you know, it's it's non it's non super focused, high energy drill training that you can do. So I wanted to make sure that was incorporated with this, that we could microdose these things throughout the day, that you could do this and it doesn't take a lot of time and what and it and there is no setup to it, right? So that's another point with all of this and how we want to do it. Okay, so these are the six exercises that are chosen. We have dots, towel jump, zercher squat, and I'm sorry, I, I've looked it up. It says zercher. Some people say zerker. I'm just going to say zercher, all right? And if it's wrong, you guys can correct me in the comments, okay? Um, and I apologize to Mr. Zercher if it is. Plate flip, <coughs> deep squat, and forward fold which is just touch your toes. So these are the six that we went through. And okay, so how does it relate to our mess with those six? Do they all have a correlation? Well, our dots, which we'll go into and what they look like. I mean, that's just your, that's a footwork drill on the dots. And that's skill and endurance. You know, we're talking about our steps, right? That's a part of playing old line and picking up our foot speed in our endurance. The towel jump is our endurance and strength, but our explosive strength, our zercher is strength, but it's our core and our lower body, and our plate flip is our zercher and upper body. And to be and you can see that we have two, you know, we talk about skill stack and we have two that have endurance related. And to be honest with you, this also is skill related and this is skill related um for offensive line play. So it, it's just you know, as you see, I'll relate it back to skill, but it, it, it's probably it's a little bit looser than the dots, in my opinion. And then lastly, for mobility is a deep squat, the forward fold. You know, this is the most elementary one you can have. Touch your toes. And this one is the most impactful in terms of playing offensive line. So those are the six that were chosen. And it relates to mess, but does it relate to our ass ass or alignment split stance or assignment step strike? Yes, right? Dots is a step is our steps. Towel jump is our step. Zercher and plate flips are part of our strike. One dealing with the, the body position, the other one dealing with our hand speed. And then we have deep squat and forward fold that deal with our stance. Remember, assignment is, uh, is on the coach to teach the player and your alignment and split are trained with all of these exercises because those are the rules of the game and where you got to be standing to it. Um, which the better you are and the more focused you are with that, the faster you'll be doing this. So now what I want to do is compare it to uh, combine testing and how it relates to on the field, okay? So my issues with the combine testing, all right? Let me just let me get my issues out here a little bit as it relates to football play. The first thing I said is it requires a lot of time and people, Uh it's hard to, you know, require to have somebody with an accurate hand to time your 40, to time your shuttle, to time your aller drill. Most places you go to don't have a vertex, you know, the vertical jump pad. They, they, they don't, you don't have the measuring tape out there. So if you just keep adding up this equipment, you're talking cones, tape, vertex, multiple people, a stick to measure the broad jump. Um, and, uh, you know, probably the easiest thing to train for is 225 on the bench press, which is why most guys throw out that number who are done playing football, right? 
Um, and almost all of them are a single rep. You get two attempts at one rep. So your endurance is almost like a marathon training to get it done um, and where it's tested. But it's certainly, you're not seeing a guy's lung capacity and his uh, his ability to withstand stuff for a full minute. Um, and it takes three months for you to train to have the best combine in testing numbers of your life. So why do I want to waste three months of guys ability to play football? I'm not coaching. I, you know, I've coached a couple guys that played pro football and have uh, had have, uh, opportunities. I think five now. Um, and a couple more that could have, but hung up the cleats from injuries. Right? So five guys, that are in position at a certain point to spend three months to do this stuff, okay? Which is what it takes or what the pros look at. So the rest of my guys, why would I make them learn the most correct 40 times so they could run a 5-4 versus a 5-6, you know? And when you compare those numbers, so a guy runs a 5-6-40 and he's 350 pounds, but oh my gosh, he trims 40 pounds down. He's now 310 and he runs a 5-3. I don't know. Is he is he like more powerful? Is he less powerful? Did he get faster? Did he get slower by losing the weight? You know, he's obviously faster, but is he faster pound for pound? You know, his, his shuttle time is two tenths of a second off. You know, what what are you getting out of those numbers other than you know your own personal PR? You know, running a forty, great. Well, what do I have to work on? You know what? Okay, so by forty times a five four, what do I need to work on on the field to play the game of football? Do I need to hit the squat rack more? Do I need to hit more sprints? Do I need to work on my start? Do I need you know where is it in that equation? And as you look at it, like just the time wasted on that, you know, three months, and and you're gonna have your guys perfecting a forty time, and their stance doesn't even look good on the field. You got a bad stance, but you look really good on that forty stance. I'm glad that we're going to test that how many times a year? Two, maybe three, that they're going to run an actual 40 with an accurate hand clock in them. And that will dictate what? You know, I, some years my fastest offensive lineman isn't even on the bus to play games. So correlating it to the game of football is my biggest annoyance with it. Um, and having a direct line. And that's where you get into, well, this would be good for O-line, but not great for DBs, or this would be great for quarterbacks, but not great for tight ends, right? That's why I wanted to have an O-line standardized testing one as well. And also, like, the combine and, and that testing numbers. And that's what kind of stinks, is that's the only one, right, to work back on. What other testing is there for football players? It always comes back to the 40, the shuttle, the, the 225. And that's why I wanted to kind of get out of the box on, okay? So as we look at it here, so speed, the combine test speed and the 40 yard dash, the shuttle and the L drill. My issues with this, and especially being in Michigan and talking with high schoolers, and also we don't have an indoor at Ferris State. So it snows in Michigan, which means and it's also like 20 degrees outside, which I don't know if anybody is recommending full on sprints in 20 degrees. You know, that takes a longer time to warm up. That takes, you know, a lot more focus. And you're also gambling on the cold, you know, cold temperatures impacting that. Um, and it's also a long setup time. As fast as you could set a 40 up, all right, which or all three of these drills up, a 40 would be the easiest is going to a football field that has lines. That's always not even acceptable or accessible for guys in the league in the offseason, right? Um, and, and measuring these out, okay? And like it, it, it takes, and even if you're saying, well, it takes no time to roll in there, lace up your cleats and stuff, it takes time for somebody to like get there, to warm up, to loosen up, to train for it. You're doing however many sprints, your start time, you know, get an accurate hand. Um, in the whole nine, it does take a while to set up and go and to do it right and proper. Like you're looking at a lot more setup time. So in terms of training for speed, we have the dots here. And this is straight out of bigger, faster, stronger. All right. Definitely uh, a lover of this. This was my high school training. 
And, and I'll kind of explain to you on how I landed on this stuff. Number one, we have these at Ferris State on the hardwood ready to go. Number two, I did this in high school. Um, and I always, in, you know, I, I thought it was such a big help on me having faster feet over the years. And I did, you know, I, I had really good foot speed and uh, a pretty good 40 and all of these things. Um, and so I thought this was really beneficial. As we go through it, I go back to, you know, okay, a, did this help me out? And if and if it was accessible to me, would it have helped me out as a player? Because again, I'm a D2 offensive lineman um, that really was an overachiever. I probably should have been a, you know, a, at best a division three tight end or H, but I ate myself into this spot. And so when we get to the dot drill here, okay? So we have uh, up and back, all right, well, we're taking we're taking our two feet here, starting off on the bottom, jumping to center, and then back out, staying in the same direction the whole time. All right, we're facing this way. The next one that we have will be where we start off in the bottom corner, and we're jumping with our right foot all the way around the world into an hourglass. And we'll repeat this with the left foot and two feet. And then the last one is that same down and back, except now we're going to flip the same direction and come back the same way. So within these five movements, you have one that you're working, uh, you know, pretty much as fast as your feet can move and the easiest one. The second thing is you're working both of your feet independently. The third one is working your feet you know, together in those spots, right? And not separating your feet. And then the third one, you're getting a rotational movement, like a fast flip, okay? Opening up your hips. In those five movements, we're going to repeat, all right, the five patterns, we're going to repeat five times each pattern. The big thing is uh, making sure that the feet hit the dots, all right? That was always, I love that it says under 50 seconds here because, when I would do this as a high schooler, like, I mean, my foot, if my foot hit here and my other foot hit here, nobody was calling me out that didn't count. So everybody was getting under 50, just moving as fast as possible. Um, and so when we do that, we'll be saying void. The times to beat are 60 seconds, 75 seconds, and 90 seconds. With all these times, uh, you know, the one thing I can tell you with this, because it is an experimental testing, and we will revisit this and show an update on it. But um, the, the numbers are going to change. That's just, you know, one of the patterns. And I've already changed my mind on a set of them. Uh, but what you don't want to have happen is nobody get a gold standard or nobody be able to get one or whatever it is, right? So you might have to lower them or raise them for a high school coach watching. Or for you guys in the, the room, we might have to lower some of these based on uh, you know, our flexibility. So we're looking at 60 seconds, 70, 75 seconds, and 90 seconds. Anything over that is a fail. So pass, silver, and gold. Those are the measurements that we will have for this. Um, I gotta skip ahead. So you can see, this is what the drill will look like, okay? So we have everybody not up be watching. If he doesn't, if somebody doesn't hit a dot directly, okay? or within the vicinity of it, the guy that's on the wall will say void, all right? And if he says void, he has another rep to it. So you might end up doing six, you might end up doing, you know, seven. Um, but when we test, it's gonna be as accurate as possible, but you can see the full look of it. You can also see here too, if I back it up, all right, in terms of testing and measuring this, if I, oh, I need to go back one more. But if a guy is short coming back to one and needs to regain his feet to hit it correctly, that is allowed here, all right? So you can see with the, you know, our offensive lineman here who lands on the center one, all right, and tries to go back to the next one, oops, doesn't get it. Okay, now he gets it. So, you know, as much as we, we want to be only five jumps for all of these, but if you do a hop, you're penalized essentially for, you know, your your steps going 
you're doing too many steps, you're going to be penalized for your time. So he, he, he did his down and back. He did his right and left. And now here comes the turnaround, which I love in being accurate with this and flipping. But you can see that we've got the dots all the way across the board here, that we can do this pretty quickly. Um, I have the measurement right here. Okay, and it's pretty easy. It's two feet by three feet and put the, this one in the center. So if you don't have these dots, get some blue tape, create those dots on the floor, in your kitchen, in your house, in your, you know, in the weight room, wherever, and they'll be planted on there for as long as they can stand before they're ripped up and then put more blue tape down. Um, again, if you're on grass, you can do this with athletic tape, um, but just if they're wearing cleats, they're going to rip it up. So, you know, in terms of we're talking about zero to minimal equipment, this is a great one because you can set this up and it stays there. So you can do this, right? And you can train for this and just do, hey, I'm going to do five down and backs. Hey, I'm going to do right foot, left foot. Hey, I'm going to do both feet. In terms of microdosing, you can train throughout the day. Um, in weeks, just by doing this once a day, twice a day, and noticing the foot speed go through the roof. So then we test explosion, okay? And with these two, broad jump and a vertical jump, which are the two I find most, uh, that, that I look for most when it comes to an offensive lineman's play, is their broad jump. I care the least amount about the other stuff, other but the most amount by the broad jump and vertical jump. And when it comes to repping 225, to me, you need to be over 20 to be to have a shot at playing in professional football. Um, 25 to 28, I would say, is like, I mean, expected if you're a guy. But 20 is the baseline. If you're not getting 20, I mean, I'm. I don't know how many of those dudes are in the league, you know, might be the same amount that have, you know, that are under six foot. All right. Or six, two, whatever. But my issues with it, again, takes too much time, equipment needed. You need a vertex to test the vertical jump, which I don't know, like we have one in our weight room, but let's say you go home for break, Christmas break, or let's say you're, we're on the road traveling or whatever you don't have a vertex. So therefore you can't train your explosion. Okay. So yes, I can, I can do these jumps, but what jumps am I going to do? Okay. I want to do these kinds of jumps. Well, all of that is an issue, right? So what we have devised is the towel jump. The towel jump, I, I think it's great because you could be at a hotel, grab two towels and be able to do this uh, and you know, do three rounds of this and it will be the best workout you've ever had and pretty fun, okay? So a standard bath towel is somewhere between 40 and 58 inches. Uh, for testing purposes, we will be putting two of them down, all right? Long ways, side by side like this. All right, maybe I could get that one looking a little closer to the actual size. All right, there we go. And we will be jumping over long ways, okay? And we want to use, it's going to be 80 inches. So we're looking at an 80 inch jump. And again, if you're training this or whatever, just use the same two consistent towels. And when you get to like an actual test day to make sure you've got the 40 inch ones. Okay. I think most hotels have a standard 40 inch towel and most people do as well. Um, and so they're going to be aligned together. And you, basically you're going to have as many jumps as you can get in one minute. And you can get a running start if you want to. You can plant your feet right here and jump back and forth as much as you can. You can, you know, you can back all the way up here and take off and land over to this spot, right? It doesn't matter because with this one, you will be penalized by the more the more distance away you are. You get less jumps, right? So it's it's advantageous to be able to land, turn around, and go, or take one step into it. The other thing I like about this is you might have a kid, right? Like a, a somebody in your room, somebody that you play with, somebody that you know that can't even get one, right? Or their broad jump is like four feet. And you're like, why are we training a broad jump? And this guy's jumping four feet. He just needs to jump. It's as simple as that. He needs to leave the ground and land softly bending his knees. Um, and so this is a perfect example of, okay, 
we're going to get a running start. And again, they're not jumping over a hurdle. They're not going to trip and, and split their leg open. They're not going to be jumping on a box. They're not going to, you know, I think that's a big thing with jumping is what are you jumping over? And that's what I was thinking of. Like, all right, I want to incorporate jumps. I love jumps. I think jumps are absolutely critical for explosion. But you're thinking, okay, you can either touch up and touch something or jump over something that's pretty uniform. To touch up and touch something, well, maybe a basketball hoop. But again, you like you got to find one. You might not have one at home. You might not have one accessible. There might be one distance away. And again, you would be leaving to go do that and hunt that down, um, which could be a process. But obviously, if you got that, you know, if you, there's one around, right, go do it. Um, dunk a basketball, all of that stuff. But when it comes to this, you can do this anywhere. You as long as you have two towels, which I mean, if you're going somewhere like a hotel or somebody else's house, I hope they have two towels. If not, pack two away. They're they're cheap. They're easy to acquire. Um, and all you're doing is putting on the ground and it's a perfect distance. There's no discrepancy. There's no, you know, whatever. It's, it's a uniform measurement system. And to, to achieve a pass is five jumps. To achieve a silver is uh, 10, and then gold would be 15 jumps. And this is also endurance. So one of the ways I came up with these numbers is I did this stuff myself, all right? So I, um, you know, put this together myself and then did it. And I think it's really good to see here too. We got the yard lines here. So you're looking at a two and a half yard jump. So if you were training on the field for this, like you don't need two towels to lay down, go over to, um, you know, a one minute cycle of landing two yard jumps, or if you're really good at it and you're training for that gold is to go three yard jumps, right? An easy, 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 easy way to train better for this. So what we're looking at here is landing and not hitting, all right, leaving and not hitting the towel. Oh my gosh. You know, I didn't even notice these knuckleheads over here ruining the video. Wildly distracting. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Cam. All right. And so, you know, it doesn't matter how you land. Um, I have seen people talk about like speed uh, acceleration and how this is coming into play of landing soft with our knees, jumping over into these points. Okay. And it's as simple as that is getting over landing and you have a one minute time frame to do this. Um, I think everybody should be able to get at least five of these in your room um, and then guys battling to get this one. So you can see here, all right, this would be a void. And this is also what will gash you and other players into this is the landing on it, okay? And that's what we're talking about with alignment and split. So as these go on, and I mean, I'm getting more and more gas rolling through this, all right? And then land, you know, okay, I'm done. <laughs> and I think it's also a great look at it too of, uh, you know, the other thing I want to note with all of this is at the end of the day, like even for myself, like that's, those, the, I don't know, six or seven jumps more than I ever would have done at that distance, period. I, I mean, like n never would have done it, right? It, it, but it gets me to because I'm excited about this and it's simple and it's easy to set up and, you know, I'm working my explosion. So this is definitely something I'm incorporating in my own workout routine of jumps and specifically distance ones and also you know, I wanted to also say this, okay? The thing that the broad jump doesn't teach you, okay, as I look at this. So the broad jump is great, okay? But see how I'm taking off on one foot and landing, all right? Like soft knees, and I'm also landing differently each time, right? Like not intentionally, but this one. I'm turning sideways and landing your technique will change and it doesn't matter how you get over it, just landing and getting over it. So that's also what we're talking about with all of this is that natural body movement to get over. And you can see too, 
right? As we talk about that skill and that bend, and you can see the impact on my knees and joints into this, but it's also teaching offensive linemen on how to, you know, withstand those high impacts with our joints, okay? That's a high impact that's coming in at the ground that I'm teaching my body on how to take the, you know, the strain of this with my ankles and my knees. And this, you know, seems like a short distance. I can assure you it was way longer than what it looks like on camera. And also um, the level that it is uh, in terms of challenging to try to get 15 in a minute. And obviously if we get more than that or we need to bump those numbers up, we probably will. Uh, I would be I'd be very pleased to see somebody hit 20 um, and to see a lot of guys do it because it is a great measurement of endurance uh, explosion. So we talk about strength um, and the combine measures strength at the bench press 225. There's other ways to measure strength, which would be, um, you know, bench, squat, hang clean, power clean, snatch, all of those. The, the issue I have, especially with any of those, is there's an ability to cheat the reps. And even if you're a strength and conditioning coach, I don't care if it's your guy and he's repping 225 and not fully extending, but there's energy in the weight room. You're counting every one of those reps. You're, oh yeah, you got 35, you know? Oh yeah, this guy, he's a DB and he just hit 28. Um, and the same thing goes with all those other ones. You know, the only one that you can't cheat is the power clean and the snatch. It's either you get it or you don't. Um, and you, can, however, you got to get to that right or the you know jerk, the clean and jerk. Uh, but those are incredibly dangerous, and they take a lot of time to 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 work on and execute. And that's why they have Olympic performance centers just for those lifts. And it's a it's an Olympic sport, so. I didn't want to have that because it's very dangerous and it takes a lot of skill to get good at that. And that time could be better spent on other things for football. And obviously 225 is great, but we're only testing the upper body strength. So that's where we landed on the Zercher squat. Okay. A Zercher squat is taking a bar, resting it in your forearms and my butt breaks parallel or even with my knee. Okay. I get, you know, for me, I think that Barr could even be hitting his thighs for a measurement, um, you know, but it's it's really hard to cheat this. If you want to cheat it, you would say, okay, round your back, but that weight is going to slide off this way, right? Um, I mean, there's really no other way to do it than hold it here. I would have taken goblet squat, but again, we're talking about uniform and uh, easy measurement, and it's really difficult for guys to, you know, you might max out the dumbbells that you have for a goblet squat, or there's the, the dumbbells uh, vary in size and shape. Um, and so that's, I, I wanted that to be out. So I wanted something with the bar, and I wanted it to be something that's super applicable to football, okay? And then mainly, this is very safe. You are putting strain on here and on your quads, right? But like it could be vulnerable, but if you're if you're lifting up here and your back gives out in a back squat, that weight is behind you, okay? And you're able to press up and cheat the rep and injure yourself. Here, if your back can't support it, that bar is dropping down to the ground and there's nothing in between it, okay? You, you know, as you raise up, it will go down in front of your body and your legs, or if you have the pegs to roll through it, that's great. Um, and this one will probably change. All right. So heads up, guys, is seven and five. All right. I'd be really shocked if, you know, uh, when we test this, if we get enough guys that have well over seven or nine, we'll keep those numbers. But I, I think I'm teetering on lowering them here because, again, I had to do it. Okay. So the weight's loaded to my, um, you know, my body weight, uh, which is 235 at the point of this video, 237, but we're going to round down for anybody that is a coach doing this. So what we want to have happen is when we talk about loading up the bar, you want to put that bar on your belly button to get underneath it there. And then two, how you cradle it, you know, whether you clamp your hands or 
you know, make a fist with them. And then what you're going to do is flex, you know, your pecs and your biceps. And then you can see this load off here. All right. Standing backtrack through feet are set. Okay. And then dropping below parallel. So I'm going bar to my knees to make sure I'm doing it. And guys, this right here is old line play, right? Snapping my hips, getting underneath somebody. My The weight that I am trying to control is in front of my body, not behind my back, in front of my body, okay? And I'm working, as you guys can see, my entire body here. So my from my hamstrings to my quads, to my calves, my shins, my lower back, my upper back, my biceps, my pecs, everything is at work to keep this weight going. And if I get to right here and injure myself somehow, I can drop that weight and not risk injury, okay? So again, three smooth and controlled reps. Man, I could have probably got, I don't know, 15, 25 reps. All right. And so that is the, the absolute progression of this. And I don't, and I think too, actually I know, and I would say the best squat that you can do is a goblet squat or a zercher squat for offensive line play, because it is the closest to being in the fit, in control of a defender and raising my hips through impact and driving with my knees. So that's why we want this lift specifically to because it applies to offensive line play specifically, okay? So again, skill stacking. We're practicing our body position, drive, and a pop through also building strength into this. I want to say that we have a great strength and conditioning program. We have a great, uh, you know, facility that's recently built. So this doesn't need to be the cornerstone. And in fact, it, we don't need to do this all but your auxiliary lifts and only putting on 135 for technique and working your way up slowly there. But the, the measurement will be your body weight. So if I'm 315 pounds, there's three plates on there. And I have to get that to my number. And that correlates. So if you are a younger guy, and you're 180 pounds, that's the measurement, right? And the more you eat, the more you gain, the more strength that we should have when it comes to that and lifting and supporting it. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're really crisp with this and not trying to be dangerous around the back or, you know, in, in working our technique. But when you have a good strength and conditioning program, you, you this this should be like if you're a real dude and you have never done this, I guarantee you that you're going to hit at least three with a little bit of work. You could work up to nine. OK. And so that's where those numbers come from. Um, and like, you know, I'm not the strongest guy, like, again, a big time power lifter over the years. Um, so this weight is, it's not, you know, and I, again, I was 300 pounds at one point. So this is, you know, this isn't like a great deal of weight and I'm hitting it for three. I, you know, if you look at it and moving the bar pretty fast, could probably go for a couple more. It's a great indication of strength as it correlates to offensive line play. Um, and also coaches strength. Okay. So the next strength one that we have are plate flips. And these are all the sensation with our O-line right now. So if you are able to use bumper plates, use bumper plates. If you don't have one, your hand, your front hand will be on the flat side of a metal plate. Okay, but the, the rule is a 45 pound plate and the reps are five, three, and one is a pass. Right now, I'm working on a one. And this goes back to, um, as I'm talking about like what I was like as a player and related to my guys and something I wish I would have had, this is definitely one of them. Nobody ever talked about grip strength um, being beneficial on the field at all. And I had, you know, my hands were always broken and, and, and they're small in general. And, you know, and I just was bad with my hands. I never used them. I was taught to use the flipper growing up, um, like I just never correlated the two. And right now I'm trying to get one plate flip right now. I've got guys that can get, and you'll see 10 or whatever, but that's a great indication of like, okay, this guy has bad hands. He's, 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 he's not getting my hand placement. Well, we got to train our hands. And what it's also going to train these plate flips, 
your shoulders, your biceps, your triceps, your lats, your pecs, all of your upper body to get this up. And essentially what you're doing is holding the plate and flipping it over, okay? So as you look here, and I had to get one of my guys to do it. I, couldn't, I can't do a 45, and I wanted to make sure that everybody could see it, all right? End over end, all right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this guy is really going strong on this one. And as long as the plate flips, okay, so he's flipping and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's end over end and he's grabbing it on the side here to this point. Great. You, you know, as long as it's on the back half of the, uh, of the other side, which he's doing right here, okay, and a great set here. Other thing to know, you cannot set this down for the rep. So if it hits the ground, your number stops. If you, you know, if it slips or it drops, the number stops. If you do not grab fully the back end of it, it does not count, all right? Everything else is fair game. So exactly how he is here is perfect. The next piece of that puzzle is, let's say he got 12 there, okay? On this next one, all right, if he only, so he doesn't get a single one, your score is zero. It is combined, it, you, we're taking the low number of this, okay? So whatever number you hit with your right hand will be the peak one that you could get with your left hand. Now we will keep PRs for right and left hand in terms of strength, but that's just a great indicator, uh, you know, to make sure. So here he's able to go one, two, ooh, so he went 12 on the first hand and he's got one for his score. So again, as we evaluate this, right, look at how he is doing, you know, a partial row. You can see that it, how fast your hand has to snap onto here, which is grasp on the field, <coughs> a lat to pull the, you know, the weight up, right, to an upright row, my bicep and tricep and forearm controlling the plate. And again, we talk about microdosing. Anytime you go in the weight room, you can get a couple of plate flips. And I recommend, like myself, to start off with a 25, all right? So I'm just doing plate flips with 25s and getting very, very close to a 45, maybe one day, right? So mobility. The next phase of it, shoulder, ankle, hamstring are all tested at the combine, but who in their right mind has this, okay? It's it like, and also too, when that number comes back, I mean, is there anything sexy about a guy, you know, like in this position up here and having somebody that can measure this and another guy to record it and having these, you know, a stick and then a ruler to get to this spot, you know, yardstick. And then I'm telling him, you're, okay, you're at 25 inches and this guy's at 32. Like, I, you know, it's hard to determine you know, how good it is and where do you mark this and all that stuff. And then on top of it, you've got, you know, the ankle flexibility ones, and then you've got the toe toucher one. Um, it, it's just, it all varies on the body shape, the player, uh, you, like, and it's also hard too. I can't give you a defined number, but this guy, in terms of his ankle test, got a 14. And you're like, okay, 14 good, 14 bad. So we want to have something that would be good and nobody has this equipment so we wanted to have um have it be easy for these guys to learn and teach okay and keep it as a common practice so the first one is the one that i love most when it comes to offensive line play okay and it's the deep squat number one our heels must be planted number two our hips must be lower or even with our knees our eyes must be level or up and our hands are together because I want to just have a uniform hand position. I love, it's got to be overhead, but I also want to put strain more so on our, our back flexibility um, and our shoulder flexibility here. Um, and if at any point these aren't met or I fold, the time stops. Gold is 120 seconds, silver 90 and pass is 60 seconds. So here I am testing it. So there's my grip, my hands are interlocked together they're over my head, all right? My elbows are straight, my knees, and as soon as my eyes go up, that's when we can start. So right there, eyes up. And the big thing here, okay, with my eyes being up, 
is that my hands, that my hands, I'm out of the frame here. My hands are above my eyes. As soon as they drop below or even, your time stops. You can also see that my feet are firmly planted in the ground. And as he rotates around here, that my, my booty is below or parallel with my knees. Okay. So the exactly what we want to be. Now, if we get too many guys that are doing this and our numbers are all good, I will work to have, you know, some sort of, um, you know, where our, our ankles must be in line with our knees. You know, if I'm actually coaching myself up here, I think that that's too close of a stance with my knees going wide. But again, at the end of the day, I have to hold this position for two minutes. And if I'm doing that right now, there's a good chance that I don't have the flexibility to hold that for two minutes, okay? And at the end of the day, doing this for 30 seconds, I mean, I you can tell on my face, as soon as I release, I'm like, oh man, that felt good, all right? And that's the real objective we're gonna have here. So again, elbows locked out, my butt is below my knees, my eyes are up, brim of the hat is misleading here, probably should have taken it off, and my hands are clasped above my head. So very simple, very easy to do. Again, this requires no equipment. This requires all, you know, the ability to just count in your head to this point. The next one we have, and it's the most old school one you got, is touch your toes, the forward fold. So legs straight, fingertips on the ground, and we want to have all of our fingertips on the ground. Uh, our butt is above our head here. All right, just another one. If you got a guy with longer limbs or somebody like that, that's the measurement to that point. And again, the same scores, right? 120 seconds, 90 seconds, and 60 seconds. Every, if you're playing at the college level offensive line, you should be able to hit, uh, you know, touch your toes for 90 seconds. We also want to make sure our feet are within our shoulder frame. So you're talking like a couple of inches apart, all right? And they need to be going forward. Obviously, our Feet need to be flat in the ground. This is a great look at it, okay? So you can see um, my knees are not completely straight. And as soon as I put my fingertips on the ground, look at, you know, this is as good as I can be here, okay? Fingertips on the ground. I straighten out my knees at a certain point here. So look what happens when I straighten out my knees. And I would say, you know, when we talk about straight knees, uh, well, some guys can't get them all the way back or whatever it is, right? That's okay. If you're within the cylinder, all right, of your hamstring or, or your, excuse me, your quad, that my knee isn't over outside of it, you know, it's borderline right in line. And again, if a guy is struggling with that, all right, and can't extend, there's no chance he's getting to it. So look at how as soon as, you know, all my fingertips are on the ground, thumb and everything, as soon as I straighten it out, boom, I can't even do it, right? I'm not even get. I might get five seconds on this thing. It just shows the importance of the flexibility needed. So now we have, you know, this offensive lineman doing it. Look at, I mean, this is textbook and a great person that takes his flexibility seriously. Fingertips are all on the ground. His legs are completely locked out, and it looks to me like he could read a book down here, right? That's great flexibility for somebody that is a generous 392 pounds plus. This is a really good job, legs extended, you know, exactly what we want to see on this, all right? And what we need to be aiming to, and I definitely believe that this guy can hit two minutes based on how comfortable he's down here. It's a great measurement for his flexibility. Okay, so then we get into the overall score. So you have 12.0, 1.0, 1.5, 2.0 for each. Okay, so 12.0 would be max score. You, if you pass something, it's a 1.0. If you get a silver, it's 1.5, and a gold is a 2.0. The other thing that's added into this is your weight. So however many pounds outside of your target weight zone, you lose, uh, you know, 0.1 of that, 110. So if you're 287 pounds and your target weight zone is three to 310, you're down 1.3 off the bat. So the highest you can get is an 11.7. So that also, uh, you know, 
punishes guys that are either heavy and dominating a lift or super light completing the offensive line left. So target weight is very important um, when it comes to this. Okay. And the ultimate purpose of this testing, all right, that I want to get, but number one, it's a very clear way to identify players' strengths and weaknesses. It also encourages them to develop these. Um, and that includes me blindly telling anybody from prospects to freshmen to players who aren't playing to coaches who want to know, I got a guy for you. I got a guy for you. He's six foot 280. Got a guy for you. Big kid. Okay, what's his number? What, what's his testing, right? Well, he runs a 40. And the, no, 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 no. What is it? Is he a 6.0 or not? 6.0 means you could be on the field at Ferris State. If you're not a 6.0, then you've got a lot of stuff to work on before we even leave that kitchen freezer to go cook that world-class meal. It also allows me to tell people and my own players and you guys that are watching, pass the test and then we can talk football. We can talk ball in the fall. If you're not even passing this test, there's no shot that you're going to dominate on the game. And it, you know, you could have, you know, be a 4.0 in the flexibility department, right? And not hit a zercher or uh, a plate flip, but still pass the test. You could be the opposite where you're stiff as hell but you're really strong and you're explosive, you're going to pass the test, you know, by the points that you're, you're, you're not getting a point on, that's a weakness. That's an easy one to get, you know, better at and better in and increase your score. It also gives the scoreboard that we were talking about earlier. Everybody has a definite, no, what's your number? My number is this. What's your number? Well, my number would be this if my weight was right. Well, dude, get to your weight and then you're good. Okay. You know, and, and it all it puts it together and putting it on a sheet and you put a bunch of competitors into that spot, man, it is a really dangerous development deal for guys to increase their, their level of play. And at the end of the day, if I have one guy that can't do a deep squat for a, a minute, can't do a forward fold for a minute, by them just going down and doing it for 30 seconds is probably 20 seconds longer than they ever train. When I go back to what I was saying about my development, I couldn't touch my toes as a player. And when I deep squatted, I mean, I, I, I couldn't extend my elbows like this and put my head like that. Like I still can barely do it. I spent no time stretching or flexibility. If this was given to me then, and they said you have to get 60 seconds to be on the field, I would have spent my time religiously focused on that. So that's that's really what we're talking about. And 30 seconds more of spent on that is going to increase your day, the, the um, something in your day, whether you're working out or not, or your productivity, and it's going to make you that much better. So that's what we're getting at. And for a guy to go from 30 seconds to 45 seconds is incredible. That, that amount of stretching, that extra 15 seconds is going to impact your game like you wouldn't imagine, man. So, all you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. And although, you know, the numbers are the numbers, uh, but that's, that's what we want to see. And if you take a look at a peak number guy here, okay, so let's say he gets a towel jump 20 times in under a minute. He does the dot drill in under a minute. He's got nine plus reps at their body weight. He, he, he does five plus plate flips with both hands with a 45 pound plate. You can do a deep squat and a forward fold for two minutes. You're talking about a 300 pound athlete who has consistent explosive endurance, a fast, accurate set of feet, strong upper body and lower body and has extreme bend. Please tell me how that guy isn't going to be playing professional football. Please to explain to me how that guy won't be. And if you got him and he isn't playing for you, then there is something that he's got to learn about the game of football that relates to his assignment. But if you have a guy that can get a 12.0 in this, he should be playing in the league. Straight up, period. And guys want to know what it takes to play in the league? If you do this, you're in really good shape moving forward with it. Um, and I think, I, just, I, mean, I think it's just such a clear instructional deal. So... What you're going to be leaving this presentation with is the ability to train guys uh, with a great purpose and focus, a scoreboard, a structure that allows skill debt, stacking, microdosing, a clear and concise knowledge of what it takes to play for our program. Uh, your players can bend, burst, and bang at an elite level, and you will also have a clear vision and path what you find is important in your position group and carry it out with the bare bones of it. Okay? So... 
I hope this was incredibly beneficial for you. Our guys are going to be doing this. I'll be making another video to show the improvements and the performance enhancements. I can tell you this, me personally, the first time I grabbed that 45 pound plate and tried to flip it once, I was like, uh, actually, we need to see if anybody can do this before I get up a number. Uh, that's how weak my hands are, right? And what we did in doing this, and it, like I, I improved my towel jumps by like four. I mean, I'm almost getting a 45 pound plate. Um, I never thought I would do dots again, and I'm you know under 90 seconds or about there. And I desperately am right now. The most important for you know a guy that's out of football would be to work on his bend, his deep squat, his forward fold, and that's exactly what I'm doing right now in terms of longevity, because I can tell you this, I am not going to be dead last in that competition in our meeting, okay, or in our O-line group. So when we do test, and I see the guys training for this, they stay after and they do plate flips. It's very communal. They're very excited about this. Um, they, hey, hey, Coach, when are we uh, we doing that? Uh, what was it, the Tuesday after the spring game? Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, and so I'm super excited to see the results in the baseline. And I can also tell you this. I just a hunch, but the five guys, the best five are going to be the highest five at these particular drills, which will ensure to me that these relate directly from on the field to off the field. And if not, you know, like, oh man, maybe this guy actually, okay. So this guy's got, you know, a better score. Why isn't he playing? Oh, that's on me. I got to teach him football. Right. So I, I, I can't wait to test this with you guys. Um, I can't wait to hear some of the results coming back. I will have this up there like a sheet to, to grade it out and to go over this stuff with. It's going to be on the, the link um, to my store. You can go there and download it. All these presentations are there for free. Go there, download them. Um, and just, you know, I, hope, I can't wait to hear the results from anybody that's outsider from our program. And I can't wait to see the results from the guys inside the program. And I'm hoping to beat some guys in the program. Um, if everybody beats me, I'll be coming back for a vengeance in, uh, in, in fall camp, all right? So just book it now. Thanks for watching. Uh, you know, this completes 25 episodes, so the next one we'll be doing is, uh, I don't even know what. We'll figure it out. But I'm enjoying these and how, you know, how smooth they're going. So uh, check you later. Chicky leader, chicky leader.